All right, so today we're talking a little bit about Foucault's Madness and Civilization. This is probably one of his most popular works tied with Discipline and Punish, which is basically all about um, prisons and penality. And in Madness and Civilization, he lays out his project quite clearly. Uh, he says, to define the moment of this conspiracy before it was permanently established in the realm of truth before it was revived by the lyricism of protest, which of course is a very eloquent way to say that madness is a conspiracy. And what do we mean by that? If you look at Foucault's works, you'll see, as is implied by one of the titles of one of his books, namely The Archaeology of Knowledge, that he's trying to lay out knowledge, and by extension truth, in a very particular way. And this is kind of like Deleuze and Guattari's uh, geology of morals, which is of course kind of a play on words of the genealogy of morals by Nietzsche. And the idea, which I think Foucault and Deleuze and Guattari have in common, is knowledge is, and, and truth, and what appears to be universal is in fact stratified like layers in a geologic column. Now, if you know anything about um, geology or environmental or earth science, you have layers of rock and over time, debris gets deposited on top of it and forms and presses itself down and layers press down on each other and they make these stratified layers one on top of each other and of course we can use this to date things inside the uh, the rock layer such as fossils because we can use various dating methods and thus we have a sort of a history of the world now Foucault is trying to do a, a similar thing and in a sense we can see the echoes of Hegel, who is deeply indebted to the idea that philosophy is very closely linked up with the idea of history. And for Foucault, he's trying to lay out this history of knowledge and a archeology span by digging up and uprooting these lower stratifications of knowledge. And it's important to go into this analogy a little bit deeper. For kind of creating an image, we can envision on top of this stratified column of rock, we have a picturesque field that appears in perfect unity and harmony. It's got all the vegetation and the trees and the sun hits everything just right and there's a little pond and deer come and uh, sip from the water and there's little bees in the tree and it's got everything you need. Now for Foucault, this is truth. This top layer that appears to have a rationality that makes sense of it all and a sort of universality. And it seems that each element works to justify other elements that the, I don't know, the height of the trees is a testament to the uh, richness of the water in the soil and underground. And the sunlight is, you know, indebted to the perfect geography of the land where the sun gets just the right amount of time uh, over everything and maybe there's mountains on each side so it's hidden for part of the day or something like this and there's kind of an internally consistent rationality that gets created and for Foucault this is how truth works it is this codified system in which everything seems to reference uh, each other and you know, this is how we can have like deduction and induction and things like this, where we can create arguments and we can find rationality in the world and we can create sciences by finding, you know, laws like physical laws, like gravity, things like this, and use this to predict our world. 
and by applying this discursive formula to the world, namely uh, rationally constructed things like uh, like math or uh, physical laws, we are a testament to the rationality of what we are studying. And Foucault sees this as a bit circular and wants to get behind it a little bit. Now, Foucault's project is to go down beneath these layers, taking apart the ideas that are used to prop up the truth that's on top and see how they came about. And by analyzing how they came about, maybe show them to be arbitrary or show them to be hiding maybe some more fundamental thing. Now, the tricky part about Foucault is he's a postmodernist, and generally it can be said that postmodernists, I'm thinking um, like Foucault or Derrida, which I hate that that's the only two that I'm saying because Jordan Peterson says the same thing, but whatever. And postmodernists are generally opposed to these totalizing meta narratives. They don't try as much to create an idea of truth as to tear it down. And in this sense, we can see postmodernism pays a great deal to Nietzsche. And I mean, I think this is a big thing about, for example, Deleuze and Guattari's uh, schizoanalysis. The idea of getting out from under the foot of psychoanalysis and trying to embrace the whole of human possibility and kind of become animal again in a way that rings true of Nietzsche. And by deconstructing these upper stratified layers of rock or of truth or of ideas, we might be able to get to something lower. It certainly seems to me that Foucault is doing such a thing because, you know, of course the question must be raised, for what purpose is all this stratification, this archeology span of knowledge being done? Why, why, is all, why are all these layers being gotten rid of? And one would be tempted to say, uh, so we can find the bottom. Now, of course, this bottom could just be construed as a new truth, as a new top, as a new picturesque discourse, which maintains its own rationality with itself. So, you know, that's a talk for another day, but it is important to stress that there are competing ideas of what this archeology span of knowledge should be for. Should it be to tear down knowledge um, as such? And if that's the case, what are we doing as philosophers? Can we, um, can we still have language and science and coherent systems of thought? Or must we try to find some sort of uh, ephemeral medium of confusion? Or it, It's kind of unclear, but Foucault is trying to show that madness has been construed as something which does not belong. Uh, similar to Edward Said's Orientalism, and of course Said pays tribute consciously to Foucault throughout Orientalism, there's a sense in which the creation of madness is an attempt to otherize. It's a way to transform some category outside of oneself into something that is paradoxically very present and thus kind of an opposite for one to measure themselves against and also to entirely destroy this other so as to prop up themselves. And this is the Hegelian master slave dialectic in spades watch my video on that if you want a little bit more clarity on that. But Foucault is not too pleased with the fact that madness has a very interesting conception which has had a number of markedly different conceptions of itself throughout history. He traces this through kind of the, I think maybe it's the 
14 or 1500s or the 1600s to about the end of the 18th century or the 19th to 20th century. And madness has been dealt with in a kind of an interesting way. He talks about the fact that originally, or not originally, but where he starts his analysis, the mad are something to be obfuscated and to be expelled uh, like some sort of disease that one is trying to get out of their bodies. And that there's this common literary figure that starts to appear, which is uh, the ship of madmen, this sail ship or this kind of wing envision like a pirate ship or something like this in which the madmen from the city are expelled onto and went on their way and they are expelled out onto the depths of the water and Foucault reads into this in a very interesting way which is to say that by putting them on the water they essentially become you know, part of the shifting tides of the past or the future, or they are relegated to some mysteriously infinitesimally small part of our concern as sane people. And to take madmen out like this is essentially an effort in mastery mastery in the sense of by conquering something as someone's other one now has a much stronger sense of identity as being sane because it's very important to the classical consciousness of uh, european style thinking that we are rational animals as aristotle would say or we have these rights in us or something like this and the question of course is by what right must we say this and you know Said points out in Orientalism the Orientalists have just been like well look at those savages over there we are not like them and thus that's why we are rational we use um, empirical observations now of course exactly what it means to have an empirical observation Said is fairly critical of throughout Orientalism. But by making this distance between oneself and something else, one's identity is confirmed and set as independent and objectively different than something else. Now, this space is what Foucault is trying to essentially get rid of. He says, in his words, I have not tried to write the history of that language, but rather the archaeology of that silence. That silence being the madman who is no longer able to speak for, him, for himself because of this distance that has been created between him and the rational animal, or the sane, or the common folk. Now, Foucault points out that a considerable portion of populations were put into, for example, the Hôpital General, the kind of first mental asylum of sorts, where madmen were sent to have treatment done to them, or in another way, merely to be put to work. Because in a way, the madman by working becomes a testament to the kind of European morality of um, work is what gives one value or something like this. So in a sense, a fairly arbitrary culture has been established and creates an other, which is expunged from outside of oneself, but is also paradoxically used to confirm oneself. So, and Hegel points this out in his master-slave dialectic, if one is master over something, there is an identity that occurs because of this difference. One is a master 
because one is a master, because one has more power, because one has some higher difference between the slave, which is a slave because he is in a position of slavery. And the positions of master and slave, of course, to be a master requires a slave, and to be a slave requires a master. So, and we can think of this, although it can apply to literal, like, slavery, like, uh, you know, slavery from Africa and stuff like this, it, like the transatlantic slave trade kind of thing, it can be expressed in a more broadly philosophical way um, when talking about identity. And Hegel talks about this in detail, but the master and the slave, because they require each other to be as such, just like white requires black or just light requires dark in order to be as such. If light had no dark, it would just be this amorphous backdrop upon which things happen. But with light and dark, now we are able to distinguish between them and they both benefit from this. Now, the problem is in the master-slave situation, if the master destroys the slave too much, we could to think of this in whatever analogy you prefer or whatever situation you prefer. But if the slave is, for all intents and purposes, made null, the master is left on his own and his identity as a master is thus nullified. But of course, if he is not harsh enough on the slave now, um, they are equalized out. And now both of them essentially cancel each other out and either has an identity. This is not me making an argument for slavery, by the way. But the point is that identity requires power. And that is Foucault's point. The identity requires this stratification to occur, which allows one to, namely the one on top, to create a discourse. And a discourse is essentially a rational whole, a method of understanding that has internal consistency with itself. Now, this could be, for example, we have a scientific discourse, or we have theological discourse, or we have literary discourse, or we have philosophical discourse, or we have you know, you could go on and on and on. And these discourses, of course, are a discourse because they have a certain identity about them that makes sense of themselves. They can talk about empirical observations, or they can make certain inductive arguments using logic to make themselves make sense. And the key word is make themselves make sense, because a discourse always only operates on itself. So the question, of course, is what lies beyond this discourse? It seems that identity itself is presupposing a discourse. And this is an important Foucaultian point, is identity presupposes a discourse and identity presupposes power. So power and discourses and identity all require each other to make sense. So it's kind of like how Derrida isn't saying that we should abolish language, but rather wants to show its contingency with itself. And in the same sense, Foucault wants to get at the fact that to have this idea of madness, of course, madness is an identity of some sorts. It's something that can apply to some and not to others. And the question, of course, is for whom does that serve? That question is your guiding question in, for, in Foucault, is whom does this serve? And by asking that question, we can use that to talk about any idea of truth, any knowledge, whether that be empirical 
or whether it be spiritual knowledge or whether it be literary knowledge or philosophical knowledge or log logical knowledge or any, any of this stuff or any set of identities or any personal identity, whom does it serve? Because of course, this idea of madness, Foucault wants to point out is a way of essentially creating a situation of mastery and servitude. The European common folk is able to section off a small portion of people and send them out on boats to be excised from the community and thus to no longer be a part of the European conscience, which Foucault kind of shows us how this eventually switches because the madman becomes more appropriated because you know we can understand how just excising them out of our town onto the high seas they're so distant that they might as well be a nothingness that does not exist and thus has no purpose for the sake of mastery so Foucault points to the Hôpital General where people are treated poorly there's a significant um, percentage of the population that is in either the Hôpital General or another kind of mental asylum institution, prison kind of conglomerate entity like this one. And these existed all throughout France and um, UK and Germany. And they were a way of putting them to labor, both for pragmatic reasons of it's free labor uh, and they can't argue because they're insane so what's the point and for another point which is that the madman becomes the negative by which the master or the common folk or the 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 european with a capital e is able to retain his identity now the important part about Foucault is Foucault sees a sort of amorphous land of human possibilities. I kind of think of this as like the body without organs in Deleuze and Guattari, um, like uh, in Anti-Oedipus or Thousand Plateaus. And Foucault sees all identity, all truth, all knowledge as sectioning off certain parts of this possibility and signifying it and making it rendered real. Because, and Foucault kind of talks about this throughout, um, madness grew to be understood in kind of a psychiatric way with certain definitions of what's the difference between mania and melancholia or um, you know just madness in general and there's this idea that they believe things which are unreal and of course these things become very real for the madman and of course this brings into the question what is real and i think a, a baudrillardian perspective is the proper way to do that so you can watch some of my baudrillard videos if you're interested but Foucault sees this penality is essentially what it is, uh, sectioning off of people and condemning them and confining them is a disservice to the human spirit, to the free spirit, as Nietzsche would talk about. For example, the, Thus Spoke Zarathustra is uh, a book for all and none, and I think it's human all too human is for the free spirit one of them is for the free spirited person or something like this anyways Foucault is extremely critical of confinement and we could talk about whether or not all identity is confinement but at the very least an identity that this clearly stratifies what would otherwise be equal individuals into mad and sane or 
Oriental and Occidental. Any sort of identity that is this stratifying is unjust and is a limit to human possibilities that is created by those in power within a discourse which appears to have its own rationality, and this would be like psychiatry or something like this, that is able to diagnose something and turn it into something that can be weaponized and quite effectively dealt with because it becomes streamlined. Because in the very beginning of madness and civilization, you know, we've got madmen going on to the ships of the mad and being sailed off to sea. And this is a fairly crude way to go about, um, you know, what is madness. But over time, institutions are created like the Hôpital General. And in a similar way to Said in Orientalism, there is a compounding effect that happens with knowledge as it gets codified into systems. And these systems create the bedrock of a discourse that give it its appearance of rationality. So this is kind of a basic understanding of the argument that Foucault is trying to make in Madness and Civilization. I'm not even all the way through this book yet, but it's been absolutely fantastic. And my fiance got this for me just out of the blue, didn't even know I wanted this exact book, but this had been on my mind for a long time and she got it for me. Uh, and it's just been incredible. Foucault's prose is second to Nietzsche maybe? That's kind of a bold claim, but Foucault is a be beautiful writer, um, very cogent and this is a great book. I've heard that Discipline and Punish is equally as great, if not greater, and I have that one on my list, so I'll be sure to do a lecture on that at some point. And I hope you like this and it gave you some food for thought, and that's it.